The Gulf War, the most televised conflict in history, ended here in the Basra Road. It was a war where 35,000 people died without a drop of blood apparently being shed. Where were the bodies in the sand? The scenes of the dying that would have forced us to look into the terrible, brutal face of war. With hundreds of TV cameras in the Gulf, where were the pictures of those new and powerful weapons? What was really happening away from the eye of the camera on the battlefields of Desert Storm? I was in Baghdad reporting that war. Five years on, I've come back to try and set the record straight. It was a war where information was part of the armory. We were controlled by the military and allied ourselves to be. An honorable few rebelled. Most of us did what we were told. In the course of this journey, we've uncovered what we should have found out then. Iraq's secret chemical war, and the coalition forces use of napalm and shells tipped with spent uranium. The invasion began at 2 a.m. A hundred thousand Iraqi troops swept across the border and made a high-speed dash towards Kuwait's capital, 80 miles to the south. Despite the warnings, the world was shocked by the Iraqi invasion. Five years later, Kuwait is back to normal. The oil is flowing, the palaces are rebuilt, and the roads are clogged with expensive American cars. But the people of Kuwait are determined that the invasion should not be forgotten. They have set up a lavishly equipped research center just to document the brutality of the Iraqi occupation. من ذلك استخدام آلة الدريل لإرهاب وتعذيب الكويتيون وهناك أدوات كثيرة تم العثور عليها مما يستعمل في عملية التعذيب. One detail they will leave out of their version of history, however, is how several days after the occupation began, the Kuwaiti government employed an American public relations firm at a cost of 11 million dollars. Propaganda supplied by public relations consultants Hill and Knowlton was swallowed whole by the U.S. political Kuwait, leadership. Young kids were passing out leaflets in opposition. They were taken, their families made to watch, and they were shot to death, 15 and 16 year old. Older people on dialysis machines, taken off the machines and the machines shipped to Baghdad. Kids in incubators thrown out so that the machinery, the incubators themselves could be shipped to Baghdad. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. <laughs> it was horrifying. Nair al-Saba, the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador in Washington, was never in the incubator ward. Nurses who worked there said they had never seen her. She was coached for her testimony to the congressional hearing by Hill and Knowlton. Robert Gray was in charge. Uh, it's always uh, difficult, of course, in a democracy, as you, as you know, to get uh, public uh, support heavily behind a commitment to go to war. And uh, the administration had made the commitment, and it was our job to help um, educate the American public on the advantages to it so that, that the support would be there. I think the impact was enormous. I think um, it was a story... Andrew Whitley worked for the human rights organization Middle East Watch. When he investigated the story, it just didn't hold water. Any depravity. Most of the incubators, which had apparently been stolen, had been stored away. When we went to the maternity hospital, we saw that there was an entire wing which had been stripped and they had been put away into a storeroom. If we've erred, obviously I, I will always hope I'll apologize. I'd like to be man enough to apologize and in all circumstances if one is due. Uh, if I were convinced one is due, then indeed I'd apologize to anybody I misled. But I would hope that they'd understand it was a very unintentional misleading. 
and I'd hope you'd understand that too. I think it was a major lie. Um, I don't believe that there was any truth in fact as to Iraqis having deliberately, systematically removed babies from incubators in order to steal them. And I think it made a major impact on public opinion in this country. And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with Hitler revisited, a totalitarianism and a brutality. Enough U.S. senators were persuaded by the incubator baby story to vote in favor of the use of force. not stand. Bush got his war. The demonization of the Iraqis had served its purpose. Following the same track. Allied forces continue the heaviest aerial bombardment of Baghdad's all time. lights were still blazing when the strike planes from Desert Storm... Up to 80,000 bombs and hundreds of missiles have been dropped on Iraq. The cruise missiles were map-reading themselves over the They're gauntlet of gunfire. We're coming over our hotel. However, we have not yet heard the sound of bombs landing, but there's tremendous lightning in the sky. Lightning like Peter Arnett, America's most famous war correspondent, got on the wrong side of the military authorities very quickly. When did your good relationship with the US military begin to fray a bit around the edges? As the bombing campaign developed, and I was revealing every day uh, more excesses, in a sense, of bombing, that they were villages, 20, 30, 40 houses had been destroyed. This is not a game. Those are human lives. Human lives. Enough of civilians. Only about 6% of the bombs used in the Iraq war were guided missiles, and they were mainly in Baghdad, the most high-profile target. Elsewhere in the country, they were using these dumb bombs, and they were devastating uh, many localities we were visiting. The crunch came when Arnett challenged the US military's account of an attack on what he said was a baby milk factory. US intelligence claimed that it was being used for biological weapons. Arnett wouldn't play ball. Marlon Fitzwater came out in the White House and said, you know, Peter Arnett is a dupe of Saddam Hussein. This proves it. And he said, we have evidence, we have absolute proof that this plant that he says is a baby milk factory is in fact used for uh, and part of the weapons testing program of the Iraqis. If this was a biological testing center, they would not have let us walk all over the premises, accompany us around the print, let us touch everything, pick up samples such as this bag. We used it for coffee. That's how confident I was. The US government is perfectly capable of lying, you know, to, to achieve its aims in, in a time of national crisis. And they did. They did. It was very effective because in the years that followed the Gulf War, that was the most frequently asked question. What about the baby milk plant? And not only the question was always, you were duped, weren't you? So that was the single most effective piece of, of uh, military black propaganda that I've seen in my whole career. And I've been in this business for 35 years. This was the beach at Al-Hafji near the Kuwait border. The first victims of the disaster struggling to free themselves from its grip. Nobody knew where the oil came from, but overnight the bird became yet another symbol of Saddam's depravity, a man who had declared war on nature itself. Was it really the Iraqis who caused the oil slick? Nobody was too sure. But it was a great story, too good to spoil with the truth. Bill Arkin, formerly in military intelligence, now lives in Vermont. His access to Pentagon military records gives him an exceptional insight into the Gulf War. I think that one of the biggest cover-ups of the Gulf War is the fact that the U.S. Navy and the Allied Air Forces attacked Iraqi oil installations and oil tankers and didn't want to acknowledge that there was a tremendous amount of controversy over that very point. And so therefore they hid behind claims of Iraqi environmental terror to avoid a debate as to whether those are legitimate targets in warfare. President Bush accused Saddam of, of uh, environmental terrorism. Yet at the same time, the Americans and the Allies were doing the same thing. I believe most of what was caused by uh, Allied planes was, a was accidental. And if you don't think torching 900 and 
60 oil wells or whatever it is is envi environmental terrorism. I don't know what is. Accidental and the bombs just fell out or what? Do you uh, mean by accidental? Uh, targets? No, not, not oil platforms. I do not believe oil platforms were targets, no. No. Distribution centers were. But uh, no, what, no. About, what about vessels? What about oil carriers? Uh, no, they were, they were stopped. They weren't, they weren't sunk. I don't remember any being sunk. They attacked those two oil platforms at Mina al-Bakur and at al-Kabar. And also at the same time, uh, they attacked ships that were uh, oil-related uh, ships. On the 18th of uh, January, on the second day of the war, uh, French aircraft attacked uh, an Iraqi tanker that was moored at Mina al-Ahmadi on the uh, Kuwaiti coast. And uh, those were the very tankers that a few days later they stated were expelling their oil into the sea. How much of that environmental da damage, in your view, with the oil six was done by the Allies? It's very clear that the U.S. in bombing offshore oil facilities and in bombing tankers, I think five tankers overall were bombed in the air war, um, caused probably you know 20 or 30 percent of the of the oil that was eventually expelled so somewhere in the area of two to three million barrels of oil uh, was as a result of allied action you don't remember a discussion about whether or not this would cause serious damage and whether or not they should go ahead with it uh, we had we had a lot of discussions about oil and we were very sen sensitive to the environmental damage and we did our best to contain it absolutely but, but to say that because we did some damage that the Iraqis were environmentally pure oh, it is saying. obscene. That's not what I'm saying. It's obscene. So it is a cover-up. It was a cover-up. Oh, cover absolutely. Up. There's no doubt about it. Do you think they lied about it? Well, of course they lied about it. I mean, have you ever read in any report that the U.S. Navy or the French Air Force attacked Iraqi oil tankers and were responsible for much of the oil that flowed into the Gulf? No. Is that a cover-up? Is that a lie? Of course it is. In Baghdad, Saddam Hussein is everywhere. People speak his name in whispers and live in absolute terror of him. When his people rose against him in desperation, they were crushed, and their leaders hanged from the roofs of their own mosques. Sanctions have pushed four million people in this once prosperous nation to the edge of starvation. But Saddam doesn't care. Today, he's constructing a new palace in Baghdad two miles from where his people queue for slops. Five, four, three, two, one, launch. Missile away! Out in the Gulf, a Tomahawk missile drills up into the ink-black sky. Deep down in the blue half-light of the control room, American sailors huddle over their radar screens, plotting its progress towards Iraq. And this is my counterpart's headquarters in uh, Baghdad. As the war went on, the video this show the became air, more uh, clinical, obscene and surreal. On all sides of the building, as the airplane overflies the building, and drops the According to the military the briefing in Saudi Arabia, you could blitz 18 million people and nobody would get hurt. Yet the demonization of Saddam Hussein was so total that his people also became demons, children of the devil, and it didn't matter what you did to them. Until two 1,000 pound bombs slipped down the ventilation shaft of a bomb shelter in Baghdad in the early hours of a February morning. Then, briefly, the reality of war was flung into our faces for the first time.
American intelligence in Baghdad had sent reports that Iraqi military vehicles were parked outside this particular shelter at night. The spies didn't bother to mention that 300 women and children were inside watching videos. Among them was the family of Tariq Mohammed. His wife and his four children all died that night. Collateral damage. This is your wife, yes? Yes, yes this is my wife. This Lina. This Sadat. This Zina. It is not good picture. They are more beautiful than this. Where were you on the night when they all died? تظارنا لما انتطفى النار وحاولنا نعثر على الجثث مليناها كانت مخلوطة قسم باقي بس شيء قليل من أجسامهم قسم ما هي جد محروقي. Did you go to look for the survivors? Did you ask when was the moment when you said I know they are dead? لحد الآن أنا يعني مثلا مرات بالبيت هسه من أقعد أشوفهم واقفين دي أشروا الجيوطة لا عقلي ما يتقبل كنت متعلق أثمن شيء كانوا بالنسبة أثمن شيء كانوا بالنسبة لي The coalition's worst nightmare was that Saddam Hussein would use his chemical and biological weapons, his notorious Al Hussein Scud missiles. The Western military have always denied that chemical weapons were used. Their denial during the war can be understood. They didn't want to terrify the soldiers. But in our investigation, we have found dozens of soldiers who say that chemical weapons were used, something the British government continues to deny. One eyewitness is Richie Turnbull, a chemical expert with the RAF. On the 20th of January, he was stationed at one of the biggest Allied air bases at Dahran in Saudi Arabia. I was on night that night when all of a sudden there was a Patriot fired from near our position and there was one almighty bang over our head as it intercepted the Scud. The warhead landed within about 400 yards of our position and all the pre-positioned naiads started giving the alarms. So we got into full uh, protective equipment, NBC Black, which is the highest state of alert. We then carried out further tests using what they call a CAM, which is a chemical agent monitor. It's a small handheld device, which again confirmed the presence of nerve agent. We then carried out a third test, which is called a residual vapor detector test. What it is, it's a small puffer bottle that draws air over a chemical sensitive disc. This again came up positive, so we carried out two further RVDs residual vapour detector tests and informed the nuclear biological uh, chemical control cell that we had an incident of nerve agents on the base. Every NIAD in the area was blasting the alarm. There was 27 NIADs giving the alarm off at the same time, so it wasn't one piece of equipment. And then we were told it was a false alarm due to unburnt aircraft fuel on takeoff. The next day I tried to reproduce the alarm using aircraft fuel. Never did, but when I used a simulated uh, test substance, it worked every time. I am convinced we had a chemical weapon attack, and the manufacturers tell me, when I've spoken to them since, if that thing shouts, it's there. We've interviewed a number of Gulf War veterans who believe that they were poisoned by low-level chemical weapons chemical weapons attacks. Um, that view is backed up by a number of reports of chemical attacks by the Iraqis. What, what's, what's your knowledge of No, I, I didn't have any evidence brought to me, and I didn't hear any confirmed evidence that there were any. Do you not think it's a case There may have been, I mean, I think at the end, afterwards, in hunting around, I was suggesting there may, the, there may have been, he may have had a few. But I, I mean, uh, but I, I don't think anything very significant. It was significant enough for Richie Turnbull. Like 4,000 other British Gulf troops, he's now sick. He has a terminal lung disease and must spend an hour every day on a ventilator. The 
chemical attack on Richie Turnbull was confirmed by a Czech detection team, now based near Prague. They tell how orders came from Central Command to ignore their findings, a bizarre order because the Czechs are world leaders in chemical warfare. They, unlike the British and Americans, train with live chemicals, spend years specialising in the field and are the only units to use mobile laboratories to double-check their findings. Richie Turnbull saw the Scud land at Daran. The Czechs were based at King Khaled Military City. In the team was Major Peter Zielinski. Zielinski ale ty větry jsou jako výškový a přízemní. A ten přízemní vítr foukal z tyhle ty části, jako od těch přístavů, od Zahránu a od Dahránu. For the past five years, UN teams have been trying to prize the truth out of the Iraqis about their chemical and biological weapons. What they have found has terrified the scientific world. Colonel Terry Taylor was the British representative on the UN investigation team. On the chemical weapons side, uh, the major agents they had was mustard agent, uh, a lethal agent, but also causes extensive burns and, and uh, very serious incapacitating injuries, very painful, nasty agent. And the other major agent was nerve agent. On the biological side, they had two lethal agents already weaponized. Anthrax is one, and uh, botulinum toxin was the other one. And these were put in aerial bombs, 122 millimeter rockets, and Al Hussein missile warheads. They have admitted to that. The authority was delegated at the time of the war, and these weapons were in the hands of the commanders in the field. One of the commanders in the field was this man, a colonel in the elite Republican Guard. He confirms that chemical weapons were being stored on the Iraqi front line. What kind of chemical weapons were there? How were they stored? In the history of modern warfare, soldiers in the trenches have been betrayed many times. The Vietnam Memorial in Washington records the names of thousands of veterans who died there. What it doesn't record is the many thousands who are sick or who have died from the effects of Agent Orange, the chemical used to clear the jungle, which also poisoned American troops. The Vietnam veterans battled through presidency after presidency before they were finally told the truth. Today, history repeats itself. In the United States, 70,000 soldiers have registered sick with Gulf War syndrome. Some recall similar experiences of gas attacks during the Gulf War. Nick Roberts wants to know what happened to his unit when an Iraqi scud exploded near their camp in Saudi Arabia. I haven't been able to keep up with the entire group, only a lot of the veterans in this area. I, I know there's 43 sick. Out of a group of how many? 112. They've been prodding and poking and doing this. And Roy that. Butler was a member of that same group. Sticking your muscles. He's undergoing medical tests to find out why he's sick. Spinal tap, that makes it back sore. <sighs>
Nick and Roy's unit were based at the port of Al Jubal in Saudi Arabia. We were waking about three o'clock in the morning with a loud, with a loud explosion. It just, it just shook the whole tent and, and it's sort of like everybody thought the world was coming to an end, you know. If you want to get real technical, I saw a big fireball or flash up towards the port of Jabal, and then the, the echo of the uh, explosion. Then we went to the bunker. And while we was outside, we felt this mist type stuff, like, you know, like a rain. My hands and my face uh, were stinging and burning. Uh, my lips started feeling funny, like they were numb. That's when the siren started going off. I had, had put on my mask while, while going to the bunker, and I, when I got to the bunker, I had to take it off and clear my nasal passages. It was, it was completely blocked. I got all kinds of gooey mess out of it, and I put my mask back on. My upper and lower lips started turning numb. And that's when we heard coming in over the radio, you know, full chemical alert, go to mop level four. That's where you put all your chemical equipment on. And we also heard over the radio uh, confirmed blister agent. <clears throat> we were told to keep our mouth shut about it, you know, kind of like a direct order uh, at a formation the next day or the day after not to talk about it anymore. That it would create so much havoc and confusion and panic amongst the men to not talk about it. <laughs> we had pretty bad attitudes. At that, after that point, we started getting an attitude. We knew we were being lied to. We couldn't get any medical help. No one would answer any of our questions. And we were getting sick. We were getting sick within a week after the explosions. A lot of us were laying in bed with night sweats, with the flu, uh, rashes, and it was all being put in our medical records. Those medical records do not exist any longer. What does exist and has recently been released under the Freedom of Information Act are central command records of chemical detections. It took four years to get these logs released, yet whole sections are missing. Jim Chewett, ex-CIA, was in charge of a US Senate investigation into chemical attacks. We asked him what the logs reported on the night Roy Butler and Nick Roberts got sick. What they told the soldiers was that it was a sonic boom. But one thing we know that refutes that is that, number one, chemicals were detected. Number two, visible explosions were seen. Number three, the soldiers got sick, nausea, vomiting, burning, stinging. Several days later, they got very ill with flu-like symptoms consistent with low-level exposures to agents or possibly even biotoxins, biochemical agents, poisons from bacteria. But we also know that the Iraqis were working on chemicals and biochemical agents, biological agents that would maim that things like aflatoxins, which make you sick in the short term, nausea, vomiting, but in the long term cause cancers. I have now got lymphoma cancer. Uh, when I finally caught it, it was stage three. And that's cancer of the immune system, lymph nodes. And I've went through three different treatments of chemotherapy. And what have the doctors told you about your health? Just deteriorating be honest with you. Department of Defense has failed to tell the truth about this issue ever since the war. Uh, they failed to tell the truth during the war. They failed to tell the truth when we first asked them for the information about what the soldiers may have been exposed to and what their experiences were during the war. So if you're asking me if I believe that they have been dishonest to our veterans, very much so. time the war made great TV, it still does. It was dramatic, it was sexy. The world getting off in a really good war. American forces broke through the Iraqi front lines in February 1991 with a tactic that had never been seen before in warfare. They used specially adapted bulldozers to bury the Iraqis alive. Among the first to reach the Iraqi trenches was Joe Queen from Alabama. He got a bronze star. 
my job was to cover in the trenches and to cave in the bunkers, right, where the uh, Iraqis were living. So they couldn't, if they overran us again, they couldn't occupy the same positions once again. And did the Iraqis keep firing at you? The Iraqis, when they, uh, Bradley went through, some of them were so uh, shell-shocked that they just came out running. Where you're sitting up there, I mean, if there's an Iraqi down here in the trench, you, you know. You're not going to see him. You know, that's what I said. I don't know exactly who was in the trench or just like the bunkers. You know, you're up there, it's called a half hatch, right? Where it's locked halfway down. And you're looking through your vision blocks because you don't want to get shot. You know what you got to do. You did it so much, you can close your eyes and do it. So you're actually down inside, buttoned up just like it is right now, you know, looking through the vision blocks, moving on with the mission. So we started plowing before we hit his minefields. We plowed through his trench line. Uh, we suppressed the trench line with a Bradley. And if he returned fire, we simply put a plow, a plow tank on each side of the trench and buried those Iraqi devils that were in the trench. And we buried about 400 Iraqis in their trenches. <laughs> واللي مجموعة الثانية رفع بالشافر واندفن هو أثناء ومع الاتراب ومع الجنود داخل الملجأ. Did you see any of them that were left in the trenches? There were some Iraqis that were shot that were in the trenches as I came through, but I was so focused on just doing what I had to do and trying to keep up with the convoy. I didn't pay that much attention. I don't know what was in the bunkers when I caved them in. Once I caved them in, I covered them up, and that's how I left. How many people died in the trenches? هي اللي شفتهم تقريبا على تقريبا قلت لك بين 300 350 لان المجموعه اللي احنا بها تقريبا بين 500 من الموقع اللي شفته قريب عليه انا مو ظل انظر يمنا ويصير هذا اشوف اللي قدامي اللي صار. 1000 dead Saddam Hussein soldiers not worth one US soldier's life. So what we did is we took the tanks with the plows and if they, uh, if they, we fired down the trench line and if little white flags came out and they surrendered, they were allowed to surrender. If they returned fire, we simply buried them and, uh, and moved on about our business. When the story about the plowing of the soldiers was revealed, uh, when rumors have circulated about the use of napalm, uh, when people have talked about the possibility that the U.S. used fuel air explosives or these daisy cutter 15,000 pound bombs were dropped or even B-52s doing carpet bombing, for some reason or another, the U.S. always denies it. You know, they always say it didn't happen. And I'm, I'm here to tell you now, it did happen. And to some degree, you have to say, well, big deal. That's what happens in war. But it is not without some degree of irony that every time one of these issues is revealed, the first reaction of the Pentagon is to say, not true, not true, never happened. And then their second reaction is to say, oh, well, let me tell you something. You know, war is a terrible thing, and this is what happens in war. But yet they don't want people to see it. How do you think the American people would have taken it if they thought Iraqi troops were being buried alive? Uh... I think, look, this is war. Is being buried alive worse than being shot through the head? I think it is, actually. You do? I, I would well, be shot what, head what, would, would, you rather, would you rather send troops armed with rifles down into those bunkers to kill the Iraqis and to be killed? If you, if you can kill them by, by burying them, what difference does it make? other than a, a minute or two of their lives. I يعني ما استطعت انه اسعفه لانه كانت نسبه النابال كثير عليه والقصف مستمر يعني اللي يخرج يعني لازم ايضا يموت معه almost 500 napalm bombs were dropped on the iraqi trenches but we never saw them land something else the us military didn't want us to see يعني النابالم هو 
يعني يحرق هذول اللي ماتوا ماتوا بالحرق يعني ماتوا محروقين وليس يعني ماتوا بسبب يعني شظية أو شيء آخر يعني احترقوا رأسا ما حي يعني ما استطعنا أن نسعفهم لأنه نسبة الجلاتين أو نسبة النابالم على جسمهم كانت كثيرة في حين أكو قسم منهم كانت يعني فقط ديهم أو فقط ظهره أو فقط رأسه يعني قدرنا هذا نسعفه بس الباقين ما استطعنا بسبب يعني ضخامة القصف اللي كان في وقتها يعني كانوا ضربونا في أربع قنابل نابالم في مكان واحد في مكان واحد أربع قنابل نابالم يعني هذا شيء كثير يعني لا يمكن أن يتصور الإنسان يعني كأنما عايشين يعني جهنم جهنم في ذلك الوقت. Do you think the American people would be shocked to know that Americans, the American army dropped napalm bombs on the Iraqis? Uh, mm, no, I don't think so. It's a very unpleasant weapon. Yes. But in some cases, there is no way, there is no other way to get troops out of deeply entrenched bunkers. You can't get them out any other way. حضرنا نفسنا للموت اعتيادي يعني كنا متوقعين في اي لحظه نموت بس بس يعني ما نموت يعني موت يعني اعتيادي لا نموت لازم يعني يكون في في قتال يعني ما من نموت يعني موته سهله As soon as you dehumanize someone, you can do anything you want. Humanity is thrown out the window. That's why we had to dehumanize Iraq and Saddam Hussein and everything before this war ever happened. And the press had to willingly cooperate in that dehumanization. Ken Jaraski was a war photographer for Associated you Press. Guys, you, got, you got soldiers with weapons. He decided that this would be his last war. His pictures were censored. Nobody wanted to spoil a good war with pictures like these. You took one particular picture, which certainly in Britain was, was published and uh, had a big impact. The guy trying to get out of the truck, his humanity is still intact. And a person can, can still feel that this was a living, breathing person that was trying to survive. And up to the very last minute with the, 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 his skin burning off his bones, that was, life was so precious that he was still trying to save it. And I figured that when I got back to the States, I'd be seeing the, the photo everywhere. But the Associated Press, when it got to New York, they pulled it off their wire and didn't send it to the newspapers. Um, so they censored it right there. Photographing dead bodies, you know, it doesn't doesn't get me off. It doesn't make my mother proud. But if I do, if I don't do this, if I don't photograph these scenes, people will think uh, war is just like what they see in the movies. The movie began to go wrong on the Basra Road. Bush realized that the public, confronted with the reality of war, wouldn't take much more of it. Today, the legacy of the Gulf War lingers on not just in the sick soldiers, but in the contaminated battlefields of Iraq and Kuwait. We were the first Western crew to be allowed into the Gulf battle zone since the war. Destroyed military vehicles are covered in a fine radioactive dust that comes from shells tipped with depleted uranium, the heaviest substance known to man. Shells tipped with depleted uranium are a new and experimental weapon used for the first time in the Gulf War. The problem with them is that the radioactive particles released when they explode remain to contaminate an area for thousands of years. Tower, 
is uh, contaminated. The reading is 125 pounds per second. These shells can slice through armor like a knife through butter. <laughs> We went to look for evidence of how 300 tonnes of depleted uranium have contaminated the Iraqi desert. In a three-day journey that covered almost a thousand miles, we find radioactive debris scattered right across the region. Exposure to low-level radiation like you'd get from depleted uranium um, could, over the course of many years, cause cancer in whatever... Dr Eric Hoskins lives in Toronto. He's a member of the Harvard medical team who went to Iraq two years ago to study the effects of the war on Iraqi children, especially the problems presented by depleted uranium. When it hits its target, it explodes, and there's very intense heat, and this intense heat allows the uranium, the depleted uranium, to oxidize, and when it oxidizes, it then turns into particles and floats around in the atmosphere, so it can contaminate the environment quite easily. Um, and when it does that, uh, is in the form of these airborne particles, um, it can float around and people either ingest it or quite often they'll inhale it. And if they inhale it, it can end up in their lungs. So for your entire lifetime, you're constantly being bombarded by this low level of radioactivity. And so over a period of a number of years, this could, in a small number of people, cause cancer. How many people do you estimate, do you know of, do you have evidence to suggest are walking around with these radioactive par particles in their lungs? Certainly a great number of Iraqi civilians were exposed to depleted uranium in the same way that a great number of American and British soldiers were exposed. Terry Walker's job was to clean up the debris of war. He knew nothing of the dangers of depleted uranium mm -hmm. and wasn't warned to take any precautions. Mm -hmm. We actually went inside the Iraqi vehicles to see what souvenirs we can get or salvage what was left of it and what equipment they had. Um, we're actually driving through all the wreckage as well. So I'm sleeping near it, eating near it. Um, if our vehicles actually broke down, the, the Challenger tanks actually broke down, um, we were there fixing the engines and we were asking the guys what ammunition do you carry and they were actually showing us and this is the U tip shell and we're actually holding it as well. When you look inside the vehicles, the bodies were there just burnt or bits of body. You can actually see all over the place and the inside was just a mess. It was just charred, you know, <laughs> there, was, there was nothing there at all. Depleted uranium was also used on bullets fired from machine guns in planes. I was uh, inside my driver's compartment when we were hit on the outside. And Robert Saunders' tank was hit in one of the Gulf War's infamous friendly fire incidents. Over 70 British and American soldiers were accidentally killed or injured by their own side. One of the depleted uranium penetrators went, it went in front of me. It's a probe up that far in front of me. Uh, a few seconds later, another one hit, and that was the one that hit farther back. I turned sideways to look. When I turned sideways to look is when I got a, got a shower of sparks in the face. The shards of metal in my face, before they were removed, uh, some days, some days they'd, they'd change color. Uh, it would go from, uh, go from a, a greenish color, or they would turn blue. Uh, and that's, that was the, the thing that, that got my attention. I couldn't understand why, why it would do this. When we went out there like, and the war started, we were issued with um, a dosimeter, which actually collected how much radiation was in the area. It was like a watch, it was black, and it had like a marshmallow dome. This would collect all the information inside the dome itself, and you would have to send it away to somebody who deals with radiation and they check it to see how much radiation was in the area at the time. Every six months they take a sample of my urine. And, uh, and that uh, the, first, the first time period, the first time they did it, 
they tested me at about 4.6 micrograms per deciliter. 400 times the exposure of a nuclear power plant worker. 400 times safe exposure. So meanwhile, I have all this radioactive junk floating around inside my body. Now, the armed forces minister has turned around and said the dosimeters were never issued to troops out in the Gulf. That's a complete lie because I had one. The whole of my unit had one. And other units had them as well. And at the end of the war, they collected the dosimeters in, and that was it. Nobody's seen them ever since. And that's when everything, all my documents disappeared. Nobody had any idea where, uh, where the papers were. Uh, when I would call to talk to somebody, I'd get shuttled back and forth between five or six different offices, talking to five or six different people. And um, If you know anything about the U.S. government, well, when they send you around to different places looking for things, they, they don't want you to find out. De depleted uranium is, is more of a problem than, than we thought when it was developed. But it was developed with, uh, uh, w according to uh, uh, standards and was thought through very carefully. It turned out perhaps to be wrong. It's something that does need looking at. And uh, the, there are suggestions which are denied that they could cause the sort of problems that people have suggested. Well, you know, you've got to review the situation, examine what actually happened if there is cause for concern, and then, depending on what you find, then you decide whether you should review its use or not. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid might happen to you? I'm afraid that in the long term, you know, possibly five, ten years down the road, I'm afraid of getting cancer is what I'm afraid of. In the past three years, birth defects, cancer, particularly leukemia, have been on the increase, according to Iraq's National Cancer Registry. Dr. Salma Haddad has made a personal study of her own cancer ward in Baghdad's University Hospital. She has found that the biggest increase is among children sent for treatment from the south, the war zone. So let's take each of these. What, 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 what were your findings? Uh, we have in this... Uh, uh, paper that there is an increase in number of cases of brain tumor after 1992, as the figures shows. This one is for leukemia? Yes, I noticed that there is an increment in the number of cases of acute non-lymphoblastic leukemia, and my colleagues also showed an increase in number of cancer cases after the war. Hey, well, well, I know you're wrong. Huh? Ah, the hell of Kurdish Okay, this child has got a flare-up of his leukemia, and uh, we haven't been able to obtain some venicristine for him. However, we hope probably we will be able to get it over the weekend. Sanctions mean that there are not enough drugs to treat children with cancer. They also mean that a third of Iraq's children are malnourished. It's easy to be complacent about war, propaganda and lies. We've got used to being lied to now. That's war, as the generals like to say. But war is fought in our name and no general or politician has the right to stop us knowing the truth, confronting what we really are saying yes to the true face of war.